Um, thanks, thanks a lot for the introduction, um, and thank you to UBC for inviting me. I've um, often been on the other side. I've been listening to a series of those seminars and always enjoyed them. So it's um, it truly is my pleasure to to be here and to see some familiar faces um, and colleagues and certainly co-authors on it uh, as well. As you said. Um, a lot of my work tries to make sense of what the Anthropocene means for the uh, ocean and, and vice versa. Um, and I'm just going to share my screen. Do you see it properly? Yes. Yes. All right. Um, thanks, everyone. So, yes. So for tonight, I thought I would... Uh, I would zoom on a very narrow topic, uh, as the title indicates, which would be something called the Anthropocene Ocean, Challenges and Prospects for Ocean Sustainability. Um, and of course, uh, I will not cover all challenges and I will certainly not cover all prospects. So this is just like an overview of some of those challenges and prospects that are relevant in that context. But let's start with the ocean, perhaps. And this visualization, which I like particularly uh, of the ocean, if you haven't re um, recognized it yet, this is indeed a world map, uh, which was designed um, by an oceanographer, uh, a geophysicist and oceanographer named Appelstan Spielhaus back in 1942. Um, and he was obsessed in trying to visualize the ocean as a continuous body of water bounded on all sides by continental masses. And the result of his work is this very distorted world map where you see the ocean as a continuous body of water um, as a unique and unique piece. And I think there's a really something really powerful in that, um, in the sense that it helps to visualize two things. First, the interconnectedness of the ocean uh, if something happens somewhere in the ocean, it's unlikely to stay there, and it is all interconnected. All oceans are connected, or ocean basins are connected into one ocean. Um, but also the finiteness of it, like visualizing it like that, you realize that any kind of activity, any kind of pressure, any kind of pollution entering the ocean is actually not disappearing over the horizon, but really staying into that body of water. These will be familiar to you. I um, mean, ocean, what are we talking about? We're talking about two thirds of the earth surface. We're talking about providing oxygen, providing life, a tremendous biodiversity in the ocean. Life has existed in it for some 3.7 billion years. That's equivalent to three times as long as life has existed on land. Out of 34 animal phyla, 33 are found in the ocean, only 12 on land. So you can imagine the potential of biodiversity. It is in fact estimated that up to 90% of marine species are still to be described. And it's of course an engine of the climate system as well, uh, absorbing excess heat, absorbing excess CO2, and really regulating currents and streams all over the planet. And increasingly, it is important for the economy as well. Uh, a couple of years ago, the OECD estimated that if it was a country, the ocean would be the seventh largest economy in the world with a conservative estimates of 2.5 trillion US dollars. But if you, in fact, take into consideration the assets associated, direct assets associated with the ocean, such as like fisheries, aquaculture, transport, and others, you're close to $24 trillion. So that's colossal, and it does not even include uh, resources such as oil and gas, which we will talk about in the future. Now, two-thirds of those direct assets rely on healthy ecosystem, which is a challenge. So used more and more uh, for the economy, also increasingly regarded as the future engine of human development. So those are a couple of headlines in the press. So you will see the ocean perceived as the solution for all kinds of challenges, whether it's food, whether it's fresh water, whether it's to mitigate climate change, to find the new medicines, to communicate, to find minerals or energy. All kinds of hopes and expectations are on the ocean uh, to deliver for the future of humanity. And if you try to kind of synthesize those, 
which is what we did with the colleagues a, a couple of years ago, and summarized it into three fundamental needs for humanity. It's the ocean for food, it's the ocean for material, and it's the ocean for space. And under each of those broad categories, of course, you find nuances of, of what we mean by food, material, and space. And certainly space is needed for the two first. So you need ocean space to actually gather food from the ocean and certainly material or energy from the ocean. Now, if you look over time, in terms of some of those uh, claims or uses of the ocean, what it looks like is something that in a different context was named the Great Acceleration. So the work of Will Stephan um, back in, in 2015 in particular, when they tried to characterize that uh, epoch of the Anthropocene, kind of an unprecedented time where everything is connected, the speed, the scale, and the magnitude of human use is unprecedented. They called it the Great Acceleration because you could see an exponential growth starting in after the Industrial Revolution, but really taking off uh, after World War II in the mid-50s across the wide range of socio-economic and environmental variables. So very much inspired by the, this name of Great Acceleration, we looked at it specifically in the context of the ocean. And, and this is what we dubbed the Blue Acceleration in the same spirit. The first thing you will notice is that the timeline is different. It doesn't start, uh, it doesn't take off in the mid 50s. It starts roughly 50 years ago and really takes off at the onset of the 21st century, just 20 years ago, across a whole range of sectors and industries. This is really a new phase uh, in human relationship with the ocean. Like humans have used the ocean for millennia, but never with the intensity or the diversity that we're seeing today. In fact, if you look just over the past 20 years only, since year 2000, these are the percent growth increase in these different uh, sectors or claims. Marine aquacultures, aquaculture is one of the world, is the world fastest food production sector. And, and here what you're seeing is that it's an 160% growth. Most, um, most deposit like hydrocarbon, large discovery of hydrocarbon like oil and gas deposits over the past 20 years of conventional oil and gas deposits have happened offshore. 70% of those have been found offshore as opposed to land. Um, marine genetic resources, that's more than 13,000 um, sequences that have been gen associated with the patents. This is used for biomimicry, for the biotech sectors. And I could go on and on over all sectors. The offshore wind farm, for instance, what you're seeing is a 51,000 person increase. That's like 500 fold increase in the global capacity of offshore wind farm. Shipping has quadrupled in just 20 years, the container shipping. Submarine cables over the past 20 years only, it's more than 1 million kilometer of cables that have been laid on the seabed. Those cables, for the fun fact, account for 99% of international telecommunication. So like, it's really the backbone of the global internet and by extension of globalization and so on, all over the place for freshwater, for minerals, et cetera. And that is, to a large extent, what you could refer to as the Anthropocene Ocean. So it's kind of a new reality uh, of the ocean today that we are seeing with this expansion of humanity into it. But the Anthropocene Ocean can also look like that, unfortunately. Uh, on the top left corner, this is Rio de Janeiro in 2016. This is a dead zone with anoxia and millions of individual fish dead because of lack of oxygen. You will recognize a hammerhead shark uh, taken coat in, in fishing net or bleached coral reefs in Belize or even the stomach content of a black-footed albatross in Hawaii a couple of years ago that has ingested plastics thinking it was food. So there is a whole range of human impacts like that expansion into the ocean space comes with a lot of impacts and you will be familiar with most of those, of course. Just a few examples. It's the same way as you have an acceleration in human use, you also have a trend of increase in some of those impacts, whether it's the percent loss of coral cover, percent loss of mangrove area, 
the number of dead zones, as I just mentioned, or the number of whale strikes, for instance, with increased traffic and maritime transport. In terms of coral reef, um, the IPCC projected that the world coral reefs will decline by 70 to 90 percent with a 1.5 degree increase and by more than 99 percent with a two degree increase. So we're, we're dealing with, with a substantial and substantial projected loss of ecosystem on the current trajectory that we're on. This graph, you probably have seen it a million times. It just shows the increase of um, large industrial fishing stock pop or population considered unsustainable in terms of, of fishing and like overfish that has increased over time. This is the increase in more ocean heat waves, as well as climate change impacts the ocean. A more recent work on noise and, and like the, the increased noise, like what's been like what's called in, in that paper, antrophony, so as opposed to biophony, like natural sound, natural noise, antrophony, so noise from human activities, because we're again using the ocean more and more, we're seeing increased noise everywhere. And more generally, um, a cumulative human impact that is quite ubiquitous in the ocean. And of course, that means that marine ecosystem um, and certainly the communities who depend on them face unprecedented cumulative pressure, not just from climate change, but also from human impacts all over the place. So how do we make sense of this new reality? And, and how do we go forward? Um, I, I work at the Stockholm Resilience Center at Stockholm University, which has the ambition to be interdisciplinary, bringing multiple disciplines, uh, also transdisciplinary, engaging beyond academic disciplines with different societal actors. And they are very obsessed also with system thinking, so thinking in terms of system. Um, and one aspect of that is this notion of sustainability science and, and sustainability. What is sustainability? And it has all often been uh, described as the intersection of three conventional pillars that would be the environment, the society, and the economy. And this sustainability would be the intersection of those three diagrams. Um, another way to look at it is to acknowledge that the economy is embedded into the society that itself is embedded into the biosphere. And with that, you kind of, with that almost hierarchization, sorry, of, of those different levels, you get a sense that a healthy functioning biosphere is in fact essential for a healthy functioning society, which itself is necessary for a functioning economy. And if anything, the past few years of uh, global pandemic have illustrated that in striking manner. You can also project that on the SDGs, typically, and visualize the 17 SDGs as the four SDGs as the foundation most linked to the biosphere, whether it's SDG 14 or forest or, or clean water and, and, and climate action, certainly, to the role of society and to the economy. Another way to think about it would be to think in terms of proximate and distal interaction. In other words, how changes in marine ecosystems are influenced by proximate socioeconomic activities and human-induced biophysical changes, which you would see, whether it's fishing, pollution, invasive species, and others. But those are embedded into a much broader um, socioeconomic context involving, of course, human migration, finance, subsidies, trades, governance, technologies, and so on. So there are multiple ways to approach that new reality of the ocean. And just to, to bring your attention on a few aspects of it, the first one is the notion of risk and how addressing ocean risk, based on what I just told you, must recognize the multidimensionality of risk. It's not just biophysical hazards, but it's also social, geopolitical, and or financial dimension. And importantly, ocean risk would typically be what you would refer to as coupled complex risk, acting in nonlinear ways most of the time. There are, of course, also interactions. Um, and that is the fact that as there are more and more users of the ocean, interaction between those users and potential conflicts will intensify as the space, as the ocean space becomes more crowded. 
here you're seeing a figure where the light blue represent different um, different ocean sectors and impacting mostly the the ecosystem. Eco stands for ecosystem. An example of that uh, in Norway, close to Sweden, would be the North Sea and Skagerrak management area, which is at the southern tip of Norway, and it's it's one of the most heavily trafficked uh, regions. The seabed there contains oil, gas, but also minerals. It's one of major commercial fishing grounds. It's also an aquaculture hotspot uh, with salmon farming in, in the different fjords. And because of those same fjords, it's highlighted as a cruise tourism favorite destination. So those are just a few of the sectors that are actually happening in the same area. Now, each one of those sectors individually have projected growth in the coming years from fourfold to fivefold increase, right? So salmon production is saying fivefold increase by 2050 in this region, fivefold increase in cruise visitor, the tourism industry says. Meanwhile, offshore wind farm capacity are saying we can quadruple, and there are more oil and gas licenses being issued. Likewise, there are increasing number of seabed mining licenses being issued by the Norwegian government. And that leads to two types of conflicts. This was something that Duver and Eller decades ago already kind of theorized in terms of user-user conflict and user-environment conflict. And so the user-user is how um, it, it's, it's a conflict that would result from the incompatibility of many sectors with each other, right? You can't fish the same way, you can bottom troll the same way, the same place where you have cables or the same way you have oil rigs, for instance. And the user environment conflict is, of course, the impact of some of those sectors on the environment, which in turn could actually hinder other sectors that depend on that healthy environment. Another aspect of it beyond the interaction is that some of those interactions will create limits, will limit the blue acceleration. But the blue acceleration might also be limited by simply the fact that ocean resources are not infinite. And what you're seeing here is a sequential exploitation, it's, it's the global offshore production volumes of crude oil and natural gas liquids um, across depth over time, right? And what you're seeing is that production is sequentially moving towards greater depths as new technologies emerge, certainly, but also because shallow water fields start to stagnate or decline, which you're seeing in the, in the three different graphs. And that, that tells you that, yes, indeed, some of those resources are finite. Um, but the blue acceleration can also uh, slow down or be limited by the emergence of systemic risk rather than predictable finite limit of ocean resources. And what I mean by that is not only the interaction between sectors, but it's also typically something we saw during the COVID-19 pandemic when the cruise tourism industry from one day to another completely shut off. And what you're seeing here is a photo taken in June 2020, so just a few months after the start of the pandemic. And those are brand new um, cruise vessels, not necessarily brand new, but as you can see, in really good state, that are being sent to be decommissioned and pulled apart because it costs too much to keep them afloat since there is no passenger. There were supposed to be 32 million passengers doing cruise tourism in 2020. Obviously, there wasn't. It's more than 200,000 jobs that were lost. The biggest uh, corporate, the biggest company in the sector lost more than 10 billion in just a few months. So the entire sector disappeared overnight. Um, and, and the result is that no one had necessarily predicted that. And last but not least, I think a, an emphasis on equity. Like with that race to the ocean, the question is, is who is racing? Uh, and certainly who is being left behind. And there are indeed serious concerns about systemic inequity in the current ocean economy. What we're seeing is like reinforcing patterns. The notion of blue justice, um, there, and, and, and an illustration of that, for instance, would be to zoom on the small island developing states, uh, seeds. There's this famous quote, we're not a small island state, we're a large ocean nation. And indeed, you can visualize that here. Those, um, those, that subset of countries account for 1.7% of the global GDP, yet 23% of total exclusive economic zones. So they are indeed large ocean nations. If you look, though, at their contribution to the blue acceleration, it looks very different. 
When I was telling you about a 500 fold increase over 20 years of the global offshore wind capacity, well, 0% of it is actually taking place in seeds, while they would benefit a lot from it because they are heavily dependent on fossil fuels for energy. 13,000 sequences um, from marine organisms, marine genetic sequences that have been patented. Only four of them have actually been patented by institution headquartered in some of those countries. Marine aquaculture, the world's fastest food production sector in the world, 0.09% of global production is occurring in seeds. And shipping, it says 7.3% here, but it's in fact an artifact of Singapore being considered a, a seed. If you remove Singapore, this is less than 2% of the total shipping. There was this report that came out, uh, Colette was a co-author and, and many others, uh, in making the point that a blue economy, something you hear very often, must protect human rights, improve human well-being, stimulate inclusion and gender equity, and prioritize recognition, diversity, and equal access to resources. This is a prerequisite to be able to talk of a truly sustainable and equitable blue economy. You have a whole range of literature really surging that tries to tackle that. Here are just a few examples. You'll, you'll probably recognize some of those titles. One as recent as this week, zooming in onto the marine biotechnology sector by uh, my colleague Robert Blasiak, and many others that really try to um, tease out and unpack what that means and what that equity could look like, and, and notions such as ocean grabbing or trying to find the condition for a sustainable and equitable economy, and so on. A figure I particularly like it comes from a paper by uh, Nathan Bennett and colleagues a few years ago that try to make the point that, you know, it's not in isolation that we will get there, is really by collaborating across different levels of the society, whether it's governments, civil societies, or private sectors. It's like by having partnership across those different levels that we could get to a, an inclusive governance of the blue economy. One level that I'm particularly interested in is the private sector. And if there is a race to the ocean, again, like this blue acceleration, uh, an intuitive question we had was, well, who's racing? And who's actually behind those exponential uh, growth in many of those sectors? And so we looked at that um, in the context of the ocean economy using the framework of the OECD of like eight ocean-based industries. This is work led by John Vierden at Duke University. And what you're seeing here is that in each of those eight sectors, typically the top 10 firms make up over half of that industry revenues. So that's, a, that's to say that right now, the ocean economy is literally in the hands of a few. If you have differences across sector, but the overall pattern is that. If you zoom in, in cruise tourism, for instance, 10 companies, in the cruise tourism industry account for 93% of all market share. In fact, if you look only at the largest three, it's 84%. So it's highly concentrated in terms of revenues. Likewise, container shipping, 10 companies, 85%. Port activities, 10 companies, 82%, and so on. Offshore oil and gas based only on offshore revenues, not accounting for land-based revenues, 10 companies, more than half of all revenues. What you're also seeing here, and that will become even more evident on the next slide, is that the offshore oil and gas today is by far the largest ocean-based industry in terms of revenues, 830 billion. The next one estimated it would be marine equipment and construction, an order of magnitude lower than that. And indeed, if you look not just within sectors at the top 10 companies in each sector, but across sectors, and just compile the 100 largest ocean uh, companies by revenues, what, what we call the Ocean 100, you're seeing here that almost half of those are oil and gas companies, and nine of the top 10. And, and, and that is striking, right? Because there is almost a mismatch between the aspiration of a blue, sustainable, and equitable ocean economy and the reality of today's extraction, par extraction paradigm from the ocean, which is heavily dominated by oil and gas. 
And these are the 100 largest corporate beneficiaries of ocean use. That's another way to look at them. And they generate together 60% of the total economy, ocean economy revenues. So if you, add, if you sum up all those sectors and just look at the 100 largest companies, it's 60, up to 60%. So they have a disproportionate influence in what, on what is happening in the ocean. If you look at where they are headquartered, although they are transnational in their operation, it looks like that. Uh, just a few countries. And, and, and what you're seeing here is you will recognize the bias from the oil and gas by, by seeing Brazil, for instance, because Petrobras, a really big oil and gas company is headquartered there. You see also the Middle East coming up because of some of those big um, oil companies. If you arbitrarily exclude the oil and gas uh, companies from the list of the Ocean 100, recompile it uh, to take in the new 100 largest companies by revenue, but excluding oil and gas, it's even more striking in terms of geographical distribution, where you see you, the USA, Europe, and uh, Asia with China, South Korea, and Japan in particular, really dominating the revenues from ocean-based industries as of today. When we published that paper, um, there was uh, it was picked up and there was an op-ed by Peter Thompson, who's this, the UN uh, United Nations Special Envoy for the Ocean. And the op-ed was entitled, What Can Corporation Do to Help Save the Ocean? And he was recognizing those 100 companies of having a disproportionate influence and possibly um, you know, having a kind of a call call for action by those companies to actually act and take on a leadership role. And of course, I'm a sustainability scientist, so I'm tempted to kind of tweak a little bit the, the heading and, and have rather something like what can corporation and scientists do together to help save the ocean? I feel a little bit uncomfortable leaving that just to, to companies based on um, history and experience. And that very much speaks to what sustainability science is or how it has been defined, right? Like going back to Robert Cates and, and back in 2011, defining sustainability science as a different kind of science that is primarily use inspired and committed to moving such knowledge into societal action. So the key here is to recognize that scientists, sustainability scientists can act as change makers. And in that sense, they can have a critical role to play in translating knowledge into action and ensuring that decision making is based on the best available science and that it and that sustainability doesn't just become a buzzword uh, for the corporate world to kind of legitimate and justify business as usual but it's easier said than done uh, yet we tried <laughs> and so in the next couple of slides I'll tell you about an initiative that has been running now uh, for a bit more than six years, entitled the Seafood Business for Ocean Stewardship, CBOS, which tried to connect science and business, um, connect fisheries and aquaculture, and connect seafood companies all over the world. Those were the, the three kind of pillars of it when, when we started that. And in practice, what it looked like was identifying the largest seafood companies uh, in the world across different segments, both well capture and aquaculture and feed production as well, and try to engage new dialogue with them uh, for ocean stewardship. So can they lead a global transformation towards sustainable seafood? Given their disproportionate influence, can they be stewards of the ocean? Uh, who are those companies? As I said, they're 10 of the world's largest companies in seafood. Here you see the name and the logos. It's 10 companies, um, but together it's more than 600 subsidiaries, right? So those companies are really big conglomerates operating across the whole planet. It's more than 400 different species that are procured, sourced, processed by those companies. It's annual turnover uh, above $30 billion, more than 100,000 different employees, and conservative estimates of their total uh, share of uh, their share of total catch uh, above 10%. And, and in specific fisheries, if you look at Ask and Pollock, for instance, or Bluefin Tuna, you get much higher number, uh, certainly across above 20 or 30% for just a handful of companies. 
How we went about it, I can't go into all the details, uh, but in a nutshell, it's been a series of dialogues. Uh, starting back in 2016 with the first Keystone Dialogues, as we called it, referring to them as Keystone Actors in the spirit of, of Keystone Spaces in Ecosystem, and trying to move and co-produce knowledge with those companies at a CEO level first, and later, uh, not just at the CEO level, but also with different operational staff um, with different meetings over the years and trying to, to move on the agenda of sustainability with a set of 10 commitments that addresses the big issue in the sector from uh, climate resilience to the use of antibiotics in aquaculture to the presence of illegal fishing or un unreported and documented fishing, IUU fishing, Mm, but also uh, carbon emissions or forced labor uh, and, and so on. So really trying a, a range of 10 commitments that the CEOs agreed to tackle. And, and that was kind of a first step for the initiative, but of course we needed to move from words to action. And so to operationalize CBOS, um, it got structured across different task forces uh, that you're seeing here, which are now in the process of being revamped a little bit and, and updated. But in essence, different task forces led by companies, supported by scientists, trying to tackle uh, the different commitments and the different challenge, challenges I just mentioned. Six, fast forward to six years and a series of dialogues um, later. What it led to is the beginning of see, starting to see results, which is encouraging at the same time as it's not enough. So I think that's going to be the, the red thread for for debriefing on, on that initiative. Um, a couple of lessons learned though or along the way is that a, a shared vision, a long-term perspective, and essentially building trust with individuals within each of those companies were was really instrumental um, to the success so far of the initiative. Also recognizing that learning has been multi-directional. It hasn't just been science to business, it's also been uh, from business to science with the reality of their day-to-day -day operation and certainly across companies as well. So like some kind of peer learning. Now, of course, the challenges are complex and that's why diverse capacities are needed, uh, breaking the silos, uh, the silos of academia, but also the silos of different segments of the industry. CBOS is starting to generate results. On, on the left side, you can see some of the headlines from, from press releases or, or media that we're reporting on the progress of CBOS. It's also connecting to existing initiatives to try to catalyze what exists already instead of reinventing the wheel. And importantly, the recognition that the scientific foundation is appreciated and has always been valued by companies as giving almost a sense of legitimacy to the efforts that they were doing. Now, the last one is almost a disclaimer, which is that it does remain an experiment, right? The, the hypothesis that we went on and, and tried to test is whether those companies could have a transformative impact on the whole industry. And we're not there yet. What we're seeing is that they themselves, within their own operation, have started moving, committing, setting up time-bound goals, reporting on it. Um, whether that has a cascading effect throughout the industry is still something um, that needs to be tested. If you want to read more, um, there is there was the first progress report from CBOS that was released at the UN Ocean Conference a couple of months ago. It's available on the website. And there's also a whole series of um, scientific uh, articles that report uh, on the initiative as it developed back in 2015. They're usually led by Henry Kosterblom, who has been spearheading that effort and all the way to a more recent one um, last year that kind of summarized where we've been over those, those five and six years. I said that CBOS was starting to inspire uh, others. Uh, an example of that would be going back to the Ocean 100 I just outlined and something we started in terms of replicating those that type of engagement with companies, the, what we named the, the Ocean 100 dialogues, very much in the spirit of CBOS. And this time trying to have impact beyond a single industry, right? So the ambition of those would be to try to get collective, transformative, ocean-wide impact across industries. Typically, what could companies do together across ocean sectors 
that they couldn't do alone or even within with others, but within their own sectors. And so we've engaged in, in starting to draft a, a series of sprints on different topics. The first one was on blue carbon. Um, the next one we're currently running is on biodiversity, where we're trying to mobilize those companies across different sectors. Now, we don't have 100 companies uh, around the table. We've managed at best to be between 15 and 20 participants, but with a nice diversity of sectors, which was encouraging. It's much harder, though, and, and maybe we can talk about that in the question, much harder to engage um, though that broader cohort of companies than it was in the seafood only. I'm mindful of the time, but I just want to finish with a series of slides on, on maybe yet another level of influence or prospect for uh, leveraging um, and creating the right incentives. So if I go back to my tweaked title of how cooperation and scientists can work together to help save the ocean, there's another possible tweak to that. It's endless, actually, you can do whatever you want. But that would be to say, what can finance do to help corporation save the ocean? And why it becomes relevant is because ultimately, when you engage in dialogue with companies, you often hear that, you know, at the end, what matters is profit. They need to show their shareholders or they need to pay back their loans. So they need to deliver on profits. And so the question is, well, can we change the incentives there or can the financial sector play a role? Of course, finance is many different things. Uh, it's public finance with subsidies, for instance, it's private finance, it can take many different shapes. And in the context of the ocean, you often hear about the ocean finance gap, which is that there is not enough investment in ocean. And an illustration of that typically would be the funding for different SDGs. If you look at the period 2015, 2019, this is how much funding each SDG has received. I let you spot SDG 14, the one dedicated to the ocean, in the very last position. It is the SD, it remains the SDG that has received the least funding. Another um, illustration of that ocean finance gap, you can find it in, in a paper by uh, Rashid Sumela and, and many others on how to finance a sustainable ocean economy, which highlights that in the last 10 years, less than 1% of the total value of the ocean has been invested in sustainable projects through philanthropy and official development assistance. So on one hand, you have that ocean finance gap. On the other hand, do remember the very first slide on the blue acceleration with that exponential growth across all kinds of sectors, like up to 51,000 person growth increase in just 20 years. That requires capital and that requires financial influx. So where is that money coming from and who's benefiting from it? And, and that's where you can start linking the trend, the companies that are operating it, and the prospect for a different type of finance, which would be corporate finance, which is the finance that companies receive to operate. And we looked at that again specifically in seafood, but this is something we could look in, in different uh, sectors as well and try to identify different leverage points uh, where the financial sector, where financial sector could influence companies' behaviors or operations. And I'll zoom in on the two first here, like the banks and the stock exchanges, the shareholders, you're probably familiar with it, is, is like individual investors in companies owning share of a company and having a voice to influence the governance of it. What we found in the seafood context is that it was very diluted. There was no key shareholders um, that had shares in many different companies. So it was not such a promising um, leverage point. On the other hand, banks are. And why they are is because loans, uh, credits from banks, account on average for more than half of all external financing a company would receive. So it's really important. And banks also have that capacity and power to tailor the terms of the loans uh, how they want, right? In something that's called a loan covenant, which is a contract between the borrower, the companies, and the financiers, the bank that decides the interest rate and so on. And that is a fascinating mechanism to introduce sustainability criteria as part of the covenant, which is not the norm now, um, but you do have examples of that. One example, for instance, is the uh, NYK. It's, a it's one of the biggest shipping company, uh, like car container shipping company in the world. 
that received half a billion dollars from a syndicate of loan, a consortium of, of different, um, different banks given to that shipping companies and where the interest rate is coupled to the sustainability performance of the company. And, and in that case, the reduction of greenhouse gases emissions. So the lower the emissions, the lower the interest rate. On the other hand, if the emissions increase, then the interest rate increase, therefore creating some kind of financial incentives for the company to do better. Another example in the seafood sector would be Thai Union that secured $400 million loan uh, from uh, different banks as well, where this time the, um, there are a set of different targets when it comes to traceability of their product, uh, also transparency and the establishment of onboard observers or, or like onboard cameras to kind of track, um, to increase traceability and transparency in their operation. And the more of those targets are achieved, the lower the interest rate. The CEOs uh, of that company uh, at the time said that it was the first time that being sustainable was actually being profitable. And what's encouraging is that you see the trends increasing over time. So you're seeing a, a rapid pickup of that mechanisms of sustainably linked loans, which is good. Uh, the downside of that is that it still account for a negligible portion of all total financing. So like those loans that are associated with system criteria are a fraction of the rest of the market and the rest of the loans that do not have any criteria. Now, finishing on the last stock, on the last uh, maybe leverage point I wanted to highlight is stock exchanges. So stock exchanges or stock market is where a company goes if uh, it wants to become public. So like increase brand exposure, increase the number of shares and open its shares for the public. So people like you and me can actually buy shares in a company. And that creates a unique opportunity to scrutinize firms and again, to take sustainability into consideration. Why? Because each stock exchange have listing requirements that a company has to comply with at the time of the listing when he, which, what is called a, an initial public offering, but also on an annual basis, which means that in effect, a stock exchange almost act as a regulatory body where a company has to comply with those listing requirements. Again, now very few stock exchanges are taking sustainability seriously in terms of their requirement, but the potential is there and the mechanism is there to introduce it. Why you could have a really big impact, for instance, if you look at seafood companies, the publicly listed seafood companies, this is the, the revenues of the world's 45 largest publicly listed seafood companies, you can see that they are highly concentrated in just a handful of stock exchanges. Most of them in the Tokyo stock exchanges, that's because Japanese seafood companies are, are really big. But if you just look at the top four stock exchanges, it's 86% of the combined revenues of those 45 largest companies. So changing the li listing requirement of those four stock exchanges only by introducing uh, criteria of, of traceability, transparency, reporting, or even changing operations in a more sustainable way could really have a big impact um, on the sector. Now, the million dollar question is why would bank do that? Or why would stock exchanges do it if the regulation don't tell them to do so? Are they going to do it uh, out of voluntary altruism? It's unlikely, but, and this is my final slide, luckily the regulatory landscape is rapidly changing as well. These are just a few initiatives. You can see the Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiative. That's a UNEP initiative that's dedicated to kind of ramping up sustainability and introducing more criteria across stock exchanges. You may have heard of the EU taxonomy as part of the EU uh, Green Deal which is really trying to set criteria for what can be considered a sustainability activities or not, and, and forcing banks to kind of report on those. And then more voluntary benchmark or framework, such as the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure, more recently Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosure, and other benchmarks that are really moving the needle in terms of incentivizing financiers to care about those metrics and therefore companies to align their operation with investors' expectation. I'll stop here with, I was on my final slide, damn it. That's the final one. And that's to say that going back to that figure, I think you know moving any of those, one of those pieces in isolation won't be enough. 
But if you really want to accelerate ocean sustainability, you probably need a collective and collaborative effort across the entire value chain. So from regulators and policymakers to the private sectors and individual companies, consumer awareness, civil society pressure, scientific, and as we just discussed, uh, financial sector as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jean-Baptiste. Um, that was really super engaging and, and thought-provoking and stimulating. Um, and I'm always amazed at your ability to, to weave a story through all the different pieces and your ability to remember the facts as well. <laughs> there are so many of them peppered throughout. Yes. Ilyas, do you want to ask your question? You should be able to unmute yourself. Otherwise, um, I'll unmute you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, my question is very quick. As a scientist, we have so many challenges facing us uh, when it comes to the ocean. So what is the main urgent, the one that's like we need to act on uh, urgently? I know everything is important, but we need to direct our uh, decision when we uh, think about research questions. That was my main uh, question here. Thank you. It might be the hardest of the evening, LS. It's, it's, it's a legitimate question, but I don't think I do have legitimate answers um it's 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 hard one i mean it depends who you're gonna ask uh, some people will tell you plastic is the most urgent thing happening in the ocean others would strongly disagree with that and tell you overfishing is um climate change certainly is kind of the background of everything happening i'm tempted to kind of evade a little bit the question and say is that you should join forces with with other disciplines so my answer to that would be you know you can't address all the challenges yet there are they are there so pick one you care about and then connect with others that actually care about other challenges and i think again going back to the collaborative and collective effort might be the way to to go about it i think there are too many to pick from to to give you a single one in honesty I think I got the point. Uh, the most urgent one is the one you care about. Thank you. Um, okay, I'll read out um, Lauren's question. Um, Lauren asks, um, how do you get large seafood companies to engage slash speak with you at all as a scientist? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and uh, a lot of that is reported in some of the, uh, in some of the papers I had, uh, I've highlighted. So do feel free to, to visit the website or some of those papers. Uh, or even send me email afterwards and, and, and go more in depth. In a nutshell, it's been a very long process. <laughs> so it started with an identification in totally independent of the companies of who were the big actors and having identified a dozen of those, then a lot of bilateral conversation to try to um, convince them of the value of joining a meeting with other companies. So it's been a lot of, uh, over a period of two years, individual conversation with just a very few scientists um, presenting themselves as coming from a, a publicly funded university in Sweden, which at the time had still this credibility, international credibility when it comes to environmental science. I I'm, I'm, I'm believe it's being eroded rapidly now, but at the time we had it. Um, and, and so convincing the companies that there was value in that. At the same time, the seafood was going through a severe crisis of a public relation with instances of forced labor in different sectors and, and different markets of the seafood, which probably and most likely also incentivized company to join. So it, it, it's almost if what we were proposing to them was quite timely in terms of engaging and reflecting on the, on, on the transformation for sustainability. And I must say that it was back in 2014, so almost 10 years ago now, uh, soon. Um, I think it would be different today as well, because you hear more and more of coalition fatigue. So there are so many people knocking on the door of some of those companies that they, are not, they don't really know where to go or, or who to listen to. And I think we benefited from a landscape that was less crowded at the time um, and to be able to motivate them in engaging. That would be a short answer. Thanks, Davey. Um, Sonia, do you want to um, unmute and then you can ask your question to Jean-Baptiste? Sure. Uh, my camera is not working, but um, very quickly, uh, maybe phrase more general, I would say, what's your vision on the role and contribution of indigenous people 
in moving to the ocean sustainability approach that you described at the very beginning, where we look at it from, you know, the biosphere and then moving up to. Um, so what's your experience and what's your vision in that respect? So that's, I, I guess that's two different, the vision and the experience is two different things because I have a very limited experience in it. So I can't speak of uh, an experience of engaging with those indigenous communities because I haven't. A lot of my work has focused on, on the very other extreme, which is like the biggest of the biggest of um, corporate actors in that landscape. When it comes to the vision, though, I see it as absolutely essential. And it goes back to the multiple benefits that the ocean is delivering the sense of place, values that I didn't talk about during the, the, the talk, but in terms of cultural aspects, sense of place, and so on. So I think indigenous uh, engaging those communities as part of a sustainable and equitable ocean economy is a prerequisite. And that's the whole challenge of the equity and a lot of the literature I highlighted, right? It's right now, they're not there. They're not in the picture of that discourse. Uh, I mean, oil and gas is considered part of the blue economy in Europe, which, which doesn't make sense neither. And you're gonna have a lot of, of those conflict. So I think it's absolutely essential, but I can't talk of my own experience because I haven't engaged. I, I've looked at the other side of the, of the picture. 